Hi, all. This is Marav Fine at the Jewish Funders Network. Thank you so much for calling in today. We've got lots of great folks on the call, and we're all really ready to learn together. Um, before we start off, um, just a brief word about uh, me and us. My name is Marav Fine, again, the program manager here for Member Services. I work with the funders who are part of the Jewish Funders Network to learn more about how they can affect uh, change in their world through collaboration and through the network. Um, every single one of our programs is rooted in a Jewish value, which is also a Jewish Funders Network value. Um, as you all know, why be Jewish is definitely the very core of what, what we think about. Um, and I would say that this falls under our inclusion, Elu Elu. We are all of us in it together and trying to learn together about how to be in this world, um, working towards the greater good. I'd like to introduce briefly, I'd like to introduce briefly um, our speakers today. We have uh, JFN board member Karen Davidson of the William Davidson Foundation. She's a dedicated community leader and philanthropist. Um, she is a member of the board of the William Davidson Foundation, which is a pri private family foundation established by her late husband, Bill. And the goal of the foundation is to promote economic, educational, cultural, and civic vitality of southeastern Michigan and Israel, as well as Jewish life and continuity. So we're really pleased to have her on the call today talking a bit about why William Davidson is committed to this work. We also have the pleasure of hearing from Dina Rabehan, I should have asked you how to say your last name. I hope I got it right. Um, who's the Associate Executive Director of Jerusalem U. Um, uh, she's been working there for over six years as a YUSP consultant. She's b Before she became the Associate Executive Director, she leads YUSP strategy and business development, product development, conferences, strategy, etc. Um, and she's really excited to talk to us about the work of Jerusalem U here. Um, and John Ferreira from Finch, um, which is the research firm that uh, did all of this research. He's, he's the Senior Vice President and General Manager. He oversees the delivery of Finch Brand's work product and helps ensure the excellence of their product. And so he's going to be talking to us about this research um, today. So without further ado, um, please take it away, Karen. Thanks. My name is Karen Davidson. I'm a member of the Board of Directors for Jerusalem U, as well as a board member for the William Davidson Foundation. At the Davidson Foundation, we care very deeply about Jewish life and continuity, and following in the thoughts and actions of my late husband, Bill Davidson. Today, is, today it is one of our grant-making focus areas, and within Jewish life, we work to advance Jewish education, Israel education, and experiences and the next generation engagement. We believe the engaging the next we believe engaging the next generation of American Jews is of paramount importance. Currently, the Davidson Foundation is investing in our young people through the Jewish Federation of Metro Detroit, Hazon, Hillel International, and Present Tense, among many others. And we're proud to be one of the funders of Jerusalem U's research project. Why be Jewish? What does and doesn't engage young Jews? And I can personally say this has been a very enlightening uh, report. I, I'm so happy to see all the people that are on the call. How do young Jews view their identity? What matters to them? What are our opportunities for reaching out to them and making a lifelong connection? We'll learn the answers to these questions and so many more during this webinar. It's now my pleasure to turn the microphone over to my friend Dina Rabhan, the president of Jerusalem U. She'll acquaint us with her organization, the research project, and walk us through the findings. Thanks. Dina, you, you're up. The conference has been unmuted. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, sorry about that. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Dina Rabhan, and I'm the president of Jerusalem U, and we're joined on this call with our CEO, Rafal Shore. Thank you, Karen, for the introduction. Jerusalem U wants a vibrant and thriving Jewish future, much like everyone who's joining on this phone call. And we focus our work on connecting young Jews 
both intellectually and emotionally, to Israel and to Judaism. And we do it using media and film. I urge you to take a look at our website, and specifically when you get to our website, which happens to be under construction, but when you get to the website, you'll see the banner on top, and it says uh, Campus Tours. And when you click on that, you'll be able to take a quick look at our trailer for one of our new films called Maconan. Um, it's a fabulous film about a young Ethiopian IDF soldier and the struggles that he faced and his perseverance, and it's an incredible film. And we've seen, we've been, we've been showing the film slowly but surely all across the country, and we've seen that this film has had a powerful effect on young people and that it touches their emotions. We've seen that the film illuminates McConan's journey as an immigrant and IDF soldier and awakens the viewer's curiosity about their own Jewish journey and their own Jewish identity. The film's themes of exploring identity and discovering oneself are universal and they're resonating with young people. And it's not a simple thing to understand what will resonate with our target audience. And I'm sure that's why we're all on the call, to learn what we can do to help resonate. Before assuming the role of president, I spent eight years as an educational consultant working with more than 200 Jewish day schools across North America and beyond. And after spending a lot of time working with school leaders and teachers and immersing myself in anything that was related to education, this is what I know with absolute certainty. Things have changed, and the way young people learn and experience our world has changed dramatically. And that means something for all of us on this call right now. It means that our programs, our initiatives, all of our work must reflect these changes. Sticking with the status quo will not ensure a vibrant Jewish future. Every educator knows that the key to effectively reaching young people is meeting them where they're at. And our young people are spending more than eight hours a day on their devices, and according to Facebook, in less than three years, Facebook will have very few words left on their pages and be mostly video. And that's why we're doubling down our efforts at Jerusalem U to make more films and general video content to share with our 16 to 28-year-old target audience and the more than 750 partner organizations that use our content. At Jerusalem U, we know that our instincts are important but that data is crucial. It would be an egregious error for our team to determine what the needs of our target audience are without hearing and learning directly from them, without studying them and researching. While we know that media and film have become a primary resource for young Jews, we also know they have, a, they have specific likes and dislikes. They have hopes and dreams. And if we have any chance of making an impact on their Jewish identity and connection to Israel, we need to know more. Jerusalem U is committed to ongoing research of our target audience. We want to make sure that all of our decisions and our efforts are guided by what we learn. And that's where the YV Jewish research comes in. Our mission is to strengthen the connection of young Jews to Israel and Judaism, and we need to better understand how young people think about their Jewish identity. We learned a lot from the YV Jewish research, and we also learned a lot from the research of Chloe Valdry, our newest team member and director of Out Outreach and Partnerships. We've shared the findings with our entire team, and we now use the data as a guide and a point of reference for our decisions moving forward. The research findings are already making changes in our strategic decisions. In fact, as a direct result of the research, we recently launched a campus tour, and this has to do with the McConan movie that I hope everyone will take a look at the trailer. Tonight will actually be our last show, the end of seven shows. We have been at UCLA, Boston University, the GA in Washington, D.C., in Chicago, at Rutgers University, last night at the University of Pennsylvania, and tonight at NYU, where we showed the movie McConan. And after the film, Chloe gave a short speech, and then we celebrated Israel with a concert from the Israeli hip-hop band Café Shahor Chazak, which means strong black Poppy. It's a, an incredible hip hop band of two Ethiopians, uh, two Israeli Ethiopians, whose song is featured in the McConan film. If you take a look, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures of uh, some of the events. 
I hope you see on these slides what we have seen. Engagement, joy, inspiration, and a powerfully positive Israel experience. The blend of movie and concert, education and fun, and connecting to Judaism and Israel through joy and enchantment are a direct result of this research. And it's been working, and we've been having the most incredible weeks, working with the college students and collaborating with as many campus organizations as would allow, we have named our tour the Unity Tour. We wanted to share the YB Jewish research with you because we're all in this together. We need each other, and we need to be smart in how we approach our collective work. At Jerusalem U, we're always looking to partner. We want to learn from you, and we want to work with you. We know that finding efficiencies in Jewish philanthropic work is incredibly important. Minimizing redundancies and leveraging each of our own unique value propositions will make the impact that we need to see. So please, please reach out to us. Let us know how this research will impact your work. Let us know what you think about it. And let's share ideas and let's join forces and get the job done. I want to thank the Jewish Funders Network for providing us with this incredible platform and opportunity to share. I want to thank Karen and the Davidson Foundation for understanding the value in research. People are often highly focused on the overhead of nonprofits, and they don't allocate the time and funding to actually stop and research and evaluate. And the Davidson's investment in our YB Jewish research speaks volumes about their commitment to our work at Jerusalem U, but also all of our work and the future of the Jewish people. So we look forward to hearing from you soon. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our lead researcher, John Freira. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, and it's been truly a privilege and a pleasure to work with everyone at Jerusalem U and in planning and executing and analyzing all this research. And uh, I'm excited to share all the findings with everyone on the phone here. Uh, we have quite a bit to share, and I'm going to move at a pretty brisk pace. Uh, but I want you to know that you are going to get a copy of this research. So as we go through, perhaps if you want to take notes of particular points or slides that are of interest, um, you will get a copy to be able to refer back to this. And the other piece that we have available for folks is there were more than a dozen secondary research studies of existing work that were input into this research. And we have a nice executive summary of that uh, that we would like to offer to everyone on the call. So um, <clears throat> starting with an overview of what we were looking to learn about and how we went about learning about this topic. The objectives of this engagement were really to diagnose why young American Jews don't feel connected to their faith and culture at the same levels of, of prior generations, understand, really thoroughly understand what the barriers are that are standing in the way of us making a difference with this group, and then develop uh, concrete recommendations for a strategy to make a difference here. And there's certainly been a lot of great work that's been done in the past in terms of research of uh, young under-engaged Jews. And I think the way that this is different and the way that this builds on it is, is three different things. First, it's comprehensive in scope. So it's including everything we've learned in the past and building on it with new learnings and trying to connect the dots and the gaps in between. Uh, we, within this research, we have the secondary research. We also uh, had a large number of focus groups on two different coasts, East Coast and West Coast. So we talked with, with young under-engaged Jews live and in person. There was a survey of 1,000 uh, people as well, and, and this spans both high school and college, as well as young adults. So really sweeping in scope and very comprehensive. Second, this focuses on the big picture in a very quote-unquote customer-centric way with, with their point of view, uh, sort of an outside-in view. Uh, we really wanted to understand their lives in both a non-Jewish and a Jewish context, understand them as people first, and so we can understand how to sort of meet them where they're at in their lives. And then third, um, really uh, focusing on concrete solutions. So uh, there were quite a few hypotheses that came throughout this research. We put those into testing and we tested them, and we have results on, uh, on what are the actual things that are the on-ramps that we think are most promising and that would be most interesting to young under-engaged Jews. Uh, so it was a three-phase process of really the secondary research, um, 
in-depth interviews. We talked with a, a wide array of people that are very sort of close to, to young underengaged Jews uh, out there, whether it's on college campuses or in different contexts. We had the research, and, and I'm going to walk you through the, the findings and the recommendations today. An important note uh, up front, I'm going to use the term underengaged a lot in this presentation, and this is how we define it. It really comes right out of the, the fabulous Pew study, a por portrait of Jewish Americans 2013, and there were two numbers that just jumped off the page to us uh, when we read that study. And first was that um, when you look at the 18 to 29-year-old age bracket, almost universally there was a sense of pride in being Jewish. But only a third of uh, young Jews within this bracket uh, strongly agreed with being, being Jewish is very important in my life. And that gap is what we see as the opportunity. And that group that exists within that gap is, uh, is the group that we're looking to, to target here and the group that we studied within this research. I mentioned uh, all the secondary research, uh, more than a dozen studies. I'm not gonna go into all the individual studies here, but we do have an executive summary that, that highlights all the key learnings from all these individual studies that's available. Focus groups, we did a dozen of them. And frankly, we do a lot of research with some of America's largest brands and this is more, this is a higher number of focus groups than we've ever done for any of them. So uh, really focusing in on both the high school segment, the college segment, and the young adult segment. And we wanted both the male and the female perspective because we know that there are, that there are differences out there. And some things are the same, some things are different, and we wanted to be able to appreciate that. Uh, it was on two different coasts, Philadelphia and Los Angeles were the, were the uh, cities. And... Uh, we have the screening criteria listed here. Uh, folks who were Orthodox were not included, obviously, because they're already uh, pretty committed, uh, and they had to match the under-engaged definition. We also didn't include anybody who may have said that uh, they had very negative views toward Israel because in a focus group environment, um, something like that could be a derailleur. And then on the quantitative survey, a nice large sample size, uh, about 1,000 respondents, uh, about half of the young people within that uh, within that sample were fell into the underengaged camp, and this was created through pooling a number of different databases from different partners, as well as uh, seeking uh, a screening from the general population with some of the uh, traditional research databases that we have, and bringing that all together. Uh, we went a little broader here, 15 to 26, to be able to segment all these individual groups. Uh, and you'll see quite a bit of data in this presentation uh, that comes from this quantitative survey. I think we're getting a little bit of feedback on the phone from someone who might not be on mute. Okay, starting with uh, non-Jewish identity and interests. Uh, family, friends, career, and personal growth are most important to young underengaged Jews, and religion and spirituality play a comparatively smaller role in their lives today. Um, here is a chart uh, that shows uh, for folks who, who said um, you know, the highest level of agreement are, are these particular topics important. And you'll see family, friends, career, and the one that really jumped off the page and was surprising to us was personal growth. And this was something that when we look into it and we split it by high school or college or young adult, it's always one of the, the top scorers, and it's something that uh, young people are focusing on in a much bigger way than we had thought. Uh, all the way on the right end of this chart, you'll see religion, 6%. Uh, so diving right into religion, that's not something that's of uh, high importance to them in their lives today. Uh, and I should say that's an overall context, so that's in a non-Jewish context. We'll show you a Jewish context later. Um, Self-improvement and connection dominate these underengaged use uh, topics of interest uh, with questions of religion trailing far behind. So uh, this chart, uh, any of the dark orange is very interested in any of these particular topics, and the lighter orange is somewhat interested. And you'll see the ones that score the best, learning how to live a successful life, becoming a better person, creating and maintaining successful relationships, making the world a better place, improving my leadership skills, tangible ways for them to become stronger, better people uh, for themselves to, to help to advance themselves, but also to advance others in the process. Um, we were surprised at just how high scoring these were, uh, but it's really, I think, an exciting and interesting insight that we can leverage. Again, all the way at the bottom of the page, 
exploring questions of faith, exploring the existence of God. You'll see a pattern coming here uh, that um, while those might be part of the end game that we want to get to, it's very much a pathway. It's very much a journey to get them to consider these questions. Ultimately, key implication here, paths to success uh, are very much uh, ahead of the pursuit of meaning. People in these age groups are not chasing down the meaning of life or these super big abstract questions, what does my life stand for? They're looking for concrete, tangible ways to bring meaning to their life uh, in, in, more, uh, in, in more real world kind of ways. So moving to Jewish identity. Uh, what good news here is uh, there's not a, a, a ton of alienation that we see. The, the vast majority of, of these young underengaged Jews, uh, being Jewish is at least somewhat important in their lives. So it, it's more of a question of true underengagement rather than alienation. So we had a question for everyone who was underengaged of, of the level of importance. And more than two thirds, it's somewhat important today. So um, there are sort of hooks out there ready and waiting for us uh, where people are have some level of receptivity to the message and taking the next step. And uh, of a comparatively smaller slice of the pie, if you look at not at all important of people who are just sort of checked out. And then we translated from a separate question, their responses that dug a little deeper into relative levels of openness. And within the appendix of this presentation, we have what those questions are, but essentially the committed piece is they're kind of on the path and they're looking forward to, to leading a, a Jewish life in the future. Uh, for high openness, they want to learn more. They can envision a greater role than where they're at today. Uh, the medium uh, piece is really about, hey, this is mostly a family cultural thing for me, uh, and they're not really sure whether it's going to increase uh, moving forward. So there's some level of openness here. And closed is really, hey, raise Jewish, but it's not that important. Uh, and I really have no interest in learning about it moving forward. So here I think there is good news, again, that there is a level of receptivity here and there's a clear opportunity for us to act on. So the door is still open uh, for the vast majority of, of young Jews to engage on a deeper level with their Jewish identity. And under engagement, um, you know, there's a lot of talk of, okay, this generation, why are they different? What's going on? What's changed? Uh, and the, the truth is that this is really a continuation of the patterns that we've seen from prior generations. So uh, when we looked at how important was Judaism in your household growing up, if you're a un young, underengaged uh, Jew in America today, more than likely you were, you were not raised in a household where your parents made it a priority versus the underengaged, uh, ver sorry, versus the engaged uh, young Jews in this study it's very much a carryover effect from parents. So something for us to think about is there, there is this cascading effect from generation to generation. Uh, and um, for each generation you lose, it's going to have a domino effect into the next. So we're really fighting the battle of lost momentum from the prior generation here. Uh, and the difference that we make with this generation here and now sets the table for what the next generation is going to look like and the generation after that. So either it's going to continue to erode or this can be the inflection point where we really make a difference and things start to move in a different direction. Tradition, family, and culture, we found, are uh, important aspects of these under-engaged Jews' lives today. Uh, so that's sort of baked in and that's ready for us to activate. Well, religion, ritual, prayer, and even spirituality lack relevance. We hear a lot in the news and in the media about spirituality, it's a fun topic for them to report on. Not as big a factor in young Jews' lives. Uh, they're not even really sure how to approach it. Um, really important point here. Jewish values may be a key link to bridge these two things. We'll talk about that in a moment. So uh, aspects of Jewish identity, these are how important all these different aspects are to them. The, the dark orange is very important, and the lighter orange is somewhat important. Jewish traditions, family ties, and focus, group, focus groups, we heard a ton about that. And even people who are relatively under-engaged in everyday life, boy, when they think about those family gatherings and those holidays, they light up and there's warmth. There's a feeling of nostalgia. They relax more. Um, it's definitely something that draws them in and they're attracted to. Jewish culture, right in line with that. Connection to the state of Israel, sort of middle of the pack, and then Jewish ritual and religion uh, further down. Um, 
but we do see in particular for the top ones, not at all important, those scores are very small. So there's really an opportunity here to make inroads. And um, we asked people uh, a whole range of statements and they could have agreed with them or disagreed. The dark orange is strongly agree. The light orange is somewhat agree. Uh, levels of agreement for connecting with the cultural aspects more than religion. That was the number one thing people agreed with. Really interesting here. Raising my children Jewish is important to me. This was the number two agreement. This was something that we, uh, we heard about within focus groups that um, it is important to folks. Much further down toward the middle of the list, uh, having a Jewish spouse or partner, relatively less important. When we talk to these young under-engaged Jews, they, uh, for the most part, were in the mindset of, I want to marry for love. I want to find the person who's just right for me, uh, you know, regardless of what their religion might be, uh, because who knows where that perfect fit might come from. But uh, many of the people who sh shared that perspective said, hey, in an ideal state, I would like to marry Jewish, all things being equal. If I could find that same person that had those, those wonderful traits that are perfect fit, I would choose the person that, that is Jewish because raising their children Jewish uh, is, is a, something that they would very much like to have. But whether your spouse is Jewish may be a constraining factor on that. Maybe it's not. Uh, but that was a really interesting dynamic. People did the third line down. Uh, we heard quite a bit of talk about feeling a certain level of responsibility to family and those that came before. So there is, certain, there is a pull to continuity here. And even the idea of breaking that chain, there was a certain sense of guilt that came from the thought of that, in particular among the young women that we talked to within the study. Spirituality and values, here's where Jewish values really um, struck us. So uh, this was, uh, again, level of agreement. I believe Judaism has a lot to teach when it comes to values. Far and away, number one of all these different aspects of religion and prayer uh, that we studied, uh, that there was the sense of, boy, there's really something there, and I feel like there's substance and there's meaning to Judaism. And then we asked people, well, what are Jewish values? And they had no idea. Um, so this is a really interesting and intriguing and enticing uh, sort of on ramp for folks, and it could be a bridge toward taking deeper levels of, and steps toward. Uh, greater connection with Judaism, uh, in, 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 certainly in a cultural sense, but also in a religious sense, is sort of getting them down that glide path. We can define what those Jewish values are and, and sort of put that out there and go on offense with it as an asset. Uh, so in our opinion, direct efforts to drive religiosity right out of the gates are not going to work. These Jewish values, there's something there, and it's up to us to define that and get it out there. And uh, people, we think, this can be a really nice connection with what we saw in the prior section about how um, motivating pathways to personal development are. Having it portrayed in a Jewish values context uh, shows a lot of promise. We dug deeper into the religion question and we saw that while uh, these underengaged Jews are not particularly religious by any means, um, nearly half of them do believe in a traditional conception of God, sort of a bi biblical conception uh, of God, and uh, that's the data here on the left. So half of them, 16% um, said don't believe uh, don't believe in a higher power. 19% uh, were believe in higher power but don't believe in God. But this this number percentage of believe in God that God exists uh, exceeded our expectations. And among that group, um, there was about half of them said they desired a deeper understanding. So there is a segment out there among the under-engaged Jewish community where uh, there is more than openness. There's even some baseline level of interest. So as we get them on that glide path and we get to those questions, I think that um, we can get people for, further down the path. Uh, the question of Israel. Uh, certainly we've seen a lot about the weaker connections to Israel generation over generation. And from what we see, that is, that is real. Uh, I terrible pun there, accidental, but um, nearly three out of four under-engaged Jews we saw view Israel in a positive light. And counter to what you hear in the news, um, the college experience for young American Jews is actually something that strengthens their connection to Jewish identity, and we'll talk about that. So uh, this data is from the Pew study, and the question here was caring about Israel as an essential part of being Jewish. 
and it's that downward staircase. And we talked about generation to generation and all the linkages in between. And you'll see on the right-hand side of the page, those millennials, it, it's lower than any other generation. But when we asked them within the study, among these young underengaged Jews, how do you view Israel? 44% uh, said very positive, 31% somewhat positive. Uh, trips to birthright uh, had a lot to do with this. Uh, but also, it's just a certain sense of, of pride associated with it. Some quotes here. I think very positively about Israel. The Jewish people are very strong to be hated and want to be pushed out to try to fight for a country. A safe place to be is respectable. Um, and um, that this is somewhere they could potentially even go as the world becomes a crazier place, that it's sort of a safe haven. Um, the one other respondent said, I have mixed feelings about the government, how it deals with things, but positive views toward the people. So people very much were able to separate the government from the people. Um, for the most part, there was very little awareness of any of the political details that are going on, foreign policy, kind of what's happening on the ground in Israel among these different age cohorts. That was true of all three, high school, college, and, and young adult. Um, we didn't hear a lot of, of negativity there, but we did hear a whole lot of positivity about the people, especially for those who have been to Israel. Uh, things like uh, very positive views of Israeli def uh, Defense Force soldiers in particular. We had all different images that we tested of, uh, of images of, in a Jewish context in Israel, and that was one of the most positive, that they saw them as themselves, young people standing up for something they believe in, uh, standing behind a cause. And when we look at views uh, toward Israel, parsed out by high school, college, and young adult, the college students were actually the ones that were the most positive. This was not something that we expected because of everything we, heard, we hear about what's going on in college campuses today. Um, the college experience is actually transformative in a positive way. So what we see here, uh, orange is, um, overall, this was how college affected your, your views toward Judaism or toward Israel. Orange is very positive effect. The dark orange, the lighter orange is somewhat positive. The gray is sort of middle of the road, and those blue colors are whether it had a negative effect. And we see uh, positive impact on uh, views toward Judaism, positive impact on views toward Israel. And we think that there are a couple things going on here. First, there are all sorts of wonderful organizations that are really making a difference at a grassroots level on college campuses. So there's an increased level of connectivity that people are able to find. Uh, but second, where people encounter any negativity, it actually forces them, it triggers and activates a sense of pride that may be embedded within themselves and they're not feeling on a day-to-day -day basis. But if they feel under attack, it actually draws them closer to their Jewish identity. Uh, I'm not gonna read all these different quotes uh, but uh, a couple of them, uh, I don't support Judaism or Israel aggressively, but if someone talks bad about it, it's on. Um, if people burn an American flag, it's because they're jealous that they burn an Israeli flag. It's meant to be uh, a real threat. Um, we found that where people had experienced any anti-Semitism or, or perceptions that uh, they felt less included, it actually drew them in closer and had uh, the counter effect. So that's, that's encouraging and good news. Uh, views toward Israel are broadly positive, and they don't need repair like we might have expected, uh, especially in college. The one caveat that I will note in the research is if somebody had an extremely hostile view toward Israel, they might have been less likely to respond to our survey. So some of those numbers in there might be a little bit underreported, but we strongly believe in the general trend based on, on what we learned. Moving to roadblocks. So what's standing in the way of making a difference? There is very much a general feeling that Judaism is out of touch with today's world in multiple ways. This is a key barrier uh, that we need to address. So here was uh, a study, uh, questions we had around roadblocks, um, around why being Jewish is, is not very important in your life. Number one, I have trouble relating to traditional Jewish institutions. We're seeing this phenomenon across the population and around the world of people having skepticism and mistrust of large institutions. It's very much true in this particular context for young people. They have trouble relating to that. Um, I don't believe in the religious aspects of Judaism. Uh, most observant Jews are out of touch with modern life. These were some others, uh, pieces about the rules, that it's a hassle, and then uh, for about a third of people not believing in God, which is a pretty fundamental barrier. Um, we saw negative views and stereotypes toward highly religious people. So some of the, in their mind's eye, of what being highly religious is, 
is a turnoff, and they view people that are highly religious as illogical or judgmental. So here are some quotes that support this. It's inappropriate to talk about politics, religion. It, show, it shows a lack of empathy. If you don't have self-awareness to know it makes people feel uncomfortable, you're selfish. Uh, religion is coming to a pre-existing set of beliefs that aren't yours. If I see someone very religious, I assume they're less accepting of science or rational thought. Uh, I definitely feel when I meet someone uh, deeply religious, that it's, it's how their family was. Uh, very few people like that just become that way, that it's sort of the imprint of others, and they're not taking time to, to think for themselves. These are some selected quotes. We have quite a few others that, that support some of these, these thoughts. Uh, and then there's a sense and a feeling of being judged by uh, the Orthodox community. And ironically, they, they shoot back judgment toward Orthodox Jews accordingly. So here are some quotes. Orthodox people look down at people who are conservative or, or reform, that they're not real Jewish people because uh, they don't follow every rule. Uh, the black hats, they eliminate half the population of Jews in the world. Yeah, it's written, but we live in a different climate. We're a minority on top of it. I'm off put when I see it. I just don't think it's the best space for religion and culture, or they're in their own world. I don't think that's healthy. In a community, you want to get to know your neighbors. I just don't know how you can raise your children to be so excluded from the world. So they felt like there's this disconnection. They felt like uh, that they're not sort of invited to the party, that they're not included. They felt like they're looked down on. And they, uh, whether that's real or not, they reflect that right back. And that is a barrier and something we need to think about, particularly in the imagery that would be presented here and who's delivering messages. On ramps, lots of promising pathways here. Uh, culture and tradition through the lens of family. I talked about sort of the warm feelings and nostalgia. This is an existing source of strength that exists in people's minds and hearts and can be activated. Uh, these warm feelings of nostalgia, connection, personal pride, there is pull waiting to be activated out there. Uh, so culture and tradition, we have various quotes here, feeling a strong connection to the Jewish people. I had to go to Camden for a trip and found out the founder was Jewish. The rest of the day, I just kind of stuck by him. Instantly, we had a connection. It helps this, this young woman to relate. Uh, cultural Jewishness comes first. It's not about as much being a minority as a Jew. When I want to feel proud, different, or stand out, being culturally Jewish comes first. That was something that we really saw. When people want to feel unique and special, they think about them, they're more likely to think about themselves in a Jewish context. Uh, and all of the stories that we heard about warm family gatherings and memories of childhood, uh, these are real positives that we can work from. Continuity, uh, we talked about that, uh, how it means following the steps of my ancestors, passing on to my children. It's a chain of relating across families. Uh, it's a family thing. I don't connect with prayers. I connect with everything my people went through. I hear a really personal story of my grandfather was in the Holocaust. I wouldn't want to throw that away. This, this young woman was, was someone who um, said that you know, she might not marry Jewish uh, and she was going to marry for love. And the thought of not marrying Jewish uh, sort of brought pain to her heart at the same time because of what it would mean for sort of her place in the chain of history. But she was very much committed to marrying for love first and foremost. And her ideal scenario would be meeting a young Jewish uh, man. So there's existing widespread strength in how young underengaged Jews view culture and tradition through the lens of family, and it's something that we can work with as an asset. We had a whole range of messages that we put into testing. Those are in the appendix. We have scores for how those performed, but messages pertaining to a shared sense of pride and connection to today's Jewish world are the ones that were most compelling. In particular, the highest uh, scoring message here was called My Commitment to Solidarity. And it related to that, that um, feeling that I spoke to earlier of if people feel like um, Israel or Jews are being attacked, it's sort of a clear and present danger. It's in the moment and their, their people are under threat. Um, that triggers a response. That triggers that pride. Uh, and they start to feel more deeply connected. Uh, and things like the more abstract my defense of our people, hey, we should band together for the future, did not perform as well. Um, we had all sorts of different approaches here, whether sort of, uh, sort of, it's like my team, sort of, uh, I'm part of the Jewish team and, and my place in history, and uh, we have all, how all those performed, but this is just a little bit of snapshot of some of the concepts that we put into testing. Self-improvement, connection, culture, family, uh, overall guidance essentially on how to live a good life. These are the topics that are of highest interest to people. So we talked about interest overall in a Jewish context, the things that are interesting to people about leading a better life. 
those are also things that are of the highest levels of interest to people within a Jewish context. I'm not going to go into each one here, but just know that the pattern that we saw is consistent. And when we ask people very specifically, okay, well, how interested would you be in learning and exploring the following topics? Uh, things around that cultural, cultural connection and warm feelings of the things that perform best. Jewish food and cooking was number one. You could imagine a uh, Jewish-themed cooking show with traditional Jewish recipes uh, with a fun and entertaining host who sneaks in sort of lo little nuggets of Jewish education and helping people in sort of a, uh, a not-in-your-face way to take steps to deep, more deeply understand who they are and what they're connected to. Learning about your ancestors, importantly, not the ancestry of the Jewish people, learning about your ancestors specifically. So, uh, you know, sort of an ancestry.com type approach to understand your personal story and where you fit into the big picture. Uh, learning about Jewish holidays. Here, the history of the Jewish people actually is right there. It's a little bit lower. Uh, so we have quite a bit of data here on what are the specific topics of interest that can inform programming, content marketing, you name it. Things along the bottom of the list here, mysteries of the Bible, um, learning the how-to of being Jewish and practicing Judaism, uh, not as interesting to people, at least while they're in this under-engaged state. As you get them along that migration path, I think that they will become of higher interest. How do you deliver it? Well, you should deliver it informally and in an in intimate fashion. So engagement tactics with a human connection, those are the ones that perform best, followed by digital content for self-exploration. Formality is not favored, I should say. Number one tactic for engagement, big surprise to us, to us, gatherings over Shabbat dinner. Things that bring people together, especially other people like them, that they can bond with and appreciate what they, what they have in common and just sort of relax and have fun, uh, incredibly appealing. This was especially appealing to college students when we parsed it out across the different segments. And we very much heard within the focus groups this as well. It's something familiar. It's something approachable. And if you think about all the different potential on-ramps that exist today for young under-engaged Jews, familiar and approachable, I don't know that I would use them to describe uh, many of the different ways where people might be able to, to start to take steps in that direction. So this is an inviting way to get them to take that first step. Small group discussions with young Jews like you. So again, informal, personal. Podcast, social media content, number three. So there is a role here, uh, sort of live, in-person, personal connection between people can be complemented by digital, interactive, on your own. Or digital and interactive can be with, with group people as well. Film screenings, you see. Uh, consistent with what Jerusalem U puts out, uh, online video content. These are also uh, high-performing tactics. So it's a combination of both. Really, the solution needs to be both offline for personal connection and online for convenience and personalization. Uh, we're coming down the home stretch here. Um, so who should deliver the message? Uh, comedians, artists, mu musicians, filmmakers. People want to be entertained and engaged. They want someone who's going to be uh, uh, really approachable and fun and not too serious, not someone who's going to preach, not someone who's going to lecture toward them. Uh, entrepreneurs also connected to how can I become a better person, very appealing. So comedians, number one, artists and musicians, filmmakers, number two. Number three, young, successful Jewish entrepreneur. Jewish entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs in general are the superstars of today. Uh, they're in the news constantly. They're, I mean, young people coming out of business school, they want to be entrepreneurs. It's exciting, it's dynamic, and this could be a promising avenue to have people deliver the message. I've talked about IDF soldiers. Number four on this list, it's essentially a different version of them, and if they lived in Israel, that would be them. Um, rabbis toward the bottom of the list, animated characters toward the bottom of the list, and we were joking that the worst possible deliverer of a message would be an animated rabbi, so I strongly recommend against that. Um, those who deliver the message must be engaging, inspiring, and relatable. Uh, targeting, uh, coming down here to the final couple slides, uh, we looked at data on the same level of openness scale, high school, college, young adult. We believe that the older age brackets, especially young adult, followed by college, then high school, is probably the one, two, three priority. High schoolers are very much taking on sort of the imprint and the image and the behaviors of the household that they live in and what their parents seem to be important. They also have less freedom to engage um, in, in a real-world way. Uh, through those informal and, and personal connections. Uh, potentially, a digital might be a way to, to reach them a little better. 
uh, but we think that young adults and college and high school is the way to go. And this spans along a spectrum of dependence, from highly dependent to highly independent, uh, and life stage of finding your fit, forming your identity, starting my story. We see it as a good, better, best approach. And it's great to reach them all, and I think we have some insight into how to reach them in different ways, um, but we do, we do have a priority order there. So key implications, it's the battle of lost momentum from the prior generation, but this door is still open. It's very much ajar and we can open it. We think we have insights now into how to do that. Um, there is existing widespread strength with culture and tradition and family. These are on-ramps uh, combined with the uh, path uh, insights into how people can lead more successful lives and become stronger young people that can make a bigger contribution. That's really where the magic happens. It's not diving directly into questions of religion. Jewish values are a promising way to frame all this up. When it comes to Israel, uh, it's not undoing or working against a lot of damage. It doesn't need repair like we expected. College students are actually a source of strength, and that experience is a transformative experience in a positive way. Uh, the solution, we think, should be both offline and online, and those who deliver the message should be inspiring and relatable. Last slide around high-level recommendations. We do believe targeting of segments in reverse order of young adults and college and high school is probably the best way to go, although specific focus on those individual groups with different organizations makes a lot of sense. The message, we should lead with these cultural connections rather than religion or even spirituality. Uh, emphasis uh, on, on how being Jewish is completely compatible with life in 2016. They're walking around thinking it's not, and there are ways that we can show them uh, we need to rebrand with the modern story with entrepreneurs and other contemporary people delivering this message and showing how they are Jewish in really deep ways and they are incredibly successful and here's, the, here's their life and here are their secrets on how to do the same thing. Self-improvement, guidance toward positive life outcomes should be central to the content uh, in order to, to build that bridge. And the medium, uh, necessary partners and alliances to unite and amplify the effect of existing efforts. From what we saw in the secondary research and talking to young people, there are all sorts of points where the baton is dropped and gaps and, and oh, you're too old for summer camp or you had your bar or bat mitzvah and there's not that logical next step. And through, as the life stage uh, progresses, people fall through the cracks. We need to fill in the cracks. We need greater collaboration of organ to, to bring these organizations together uh, and then have greater communication and new programming online and offline and delivering it with, through the voice of successful uh, Jews who are visible ambassadors for Judaism. So that's, that's what we have. Um, I know I covered a lot, went about 100 miles an hour, but we wanted to give you a very broad overview of everything we've learned. Uh, there's even more of that. You're going to get a copy of this. But with the time we have left, I'd love to open it up to any questions that folks might have. The conference has been unmuted. Okay, folks. So I've unmuted all of you. Um, so you may ask questions out loud. Uh, if you feel more comfortable just typing them to me, you can either email them or chat them. We have about 10 minutes, just under 10 minutes for questions. Hi. Um, is any of your research broken out by gender? Um, we do have data cuts of that, and, uh, and we can provide that. For the most part, we saw um, not as many differences as we would have expected. Uh, one area where we did see some, some greater differences was in sort of future perspective of family and relative importance of having a Jewish spouse and, and views toward having a, 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 a Jewish family in the future, and it definitely skewed toward higher levels of importance for uh, young under-engaged uh, women versus women. young under-engaged men. Thank you. I'd similarly like to know if it's broken out by the age ranges that you identify in that, in that one of those last slides. Like, do you have it for your high school respondents versus your young adult, or is that accessible as part of your report? Yeah, we have some of our charts are broken out that way. I think even this one in the appendix, importance of life, high school, college, young adult. Uh, so there are a number of charts that are broken out that way, but if there was a very specific question that you had within anything you saw where you don't see it broken out, that's something that we could uh, pursue. Hi, I have a couple questions that were typed in. I'll just read them both, and you guys can respond to both. First question is, 
or children of intermarried families excluded and does that skew results? And the second one is, is there any data on the LGBTQ population and its connection to Judaism? Um, first question is no, they were not excluded. Um, so that uh, within the focus groups, I believe we had that they had to have had a Jewish mother. Uh, that constraint was uh, relaxed for the uh, quantitative survey. So that's really everyone in the tent for that quant survey. Um, and then uh, specific data, uh, we do not have uh, specific data on uh, uh, LGBT uh, uh, responses. That wasn't a question that we asked people within the research, so we weren't able to segment that way. I can say that the attitude, we did ask people questions about perceptions related to that community, and there was a high degree of um, uh, respect and feeling that um, you know, acceptance and inclusion is an important part of sort of being uh, just a young adult in today's world. And there was some friction that we saw in believing that high re highly religious members of the Jewish community are not accepting to that group. There are even a couple quotes that I, I'm not sure if we pulled them out for this version, but um, that, uh, that spoke to that. So um, that is one of the barriers that we need to show people that, um, uh, you know, the, the, that um, there is openness and acceptance there. We have a couple more minutes. I have a question. Do you have any sense on how this would apply to uh, kids who are middle school age? Um, my sense is that it would be an even further amplified view of what we saw with high schoolers. So um, moving to that uh, spectrum of dependence versus independence. Um, I, I would think that it's even more so taking on the imprint and influence of uh, the adults that are within your household. Um, although uh, bar and bat mitzvah preparation is sort of a variable that I'm not entirely sure how that would affect things. We did hear that um, the views toward the work that was put into that wasn't always the most positive thing. And I know that that was present in some of the secondary research that we saw. So um, I, I don't have any reason to believe that, um, that they would be more open. Uh, my hypothesis would be that they would probably be less open. Did you talk about the um, socioeconomic uh, um, qualities of the focus groups or the geographic ones? I don't recall. Yeah, so the focus groups were in the Philadelphia metro area as well as the Los Angeles uh, metro area, and we did not use income as a means to screen people or screen out. So it just sort of fell within um, uh, randomly and representatively of the local Jewish uh, communities. Did you have any, I didn't see this as part of the study, but did you ask questions about what kind of Jewish educational settings these people typically participate in? Um, yes, we did. And there, there were definitely some people who had been, uh, had experiences with more formal um, Jewish education. And uh, in fact, some of the, for some people, um, that highly formal Jewish education was actually one of the factors that, that pushed them away, um, that it felt like uh, an institution, it felt like um, it was perhaps not a, an environment for their independent thought. Uh, and there were a number of people that, um, even some from a couple people from that had gone to Jewish day school that um, you know, that, that was a, a factor. Small sample size, uh, so I can't draw any definitive conclusions, but I would say in general, consistent with what we've learned, uh, the more formal, uh, the more uh, prescriptive 
the more lecture-based that things are, the less likely that young people are going to relate to it and it's going to draw them closer to Judaism. And for some people, some subset of them, it will actually push them further away. So having things that are less formal, uh, less lecture-based in terms of this is what you have to memorize and this sort of this is the truth, inviting two-way dialogue and conversation or having surprising and engaging topics, those are promised, probably promising pathways. I mean, there's certainly a, a, a role for, for formal Jewish education uh, an important role that they play, and, and, and there is an important role for, for helping people to establish that aspect of their Jewish identity, and, and I would encourage a complementary uh, approach of the less formal, um, highly approachable kind of two-way conversation. Okay, everyone. Um, we just have one minute left, so I want to close. I want to thank you all for being on this call today. Um, special thanks to Karen, um, to Dina, and to John for your diligence. And um, you're, I'm really impressed with how quickly you got through all these slides. Um, um, it was great to learn about all of this with you together, and I know there will be a lot more questions sort of following up. Again, as a reminder, this has been recorded, so we will be sending around a YouTube as well as um, copies of the, the research itself, um, with many thanks to the folks at Jerusalem U and at Finch and Davidson for um, providing that. So we'll also be sending around the contact information for the folks you heard speaking today. If you have specific questions, you're also always welcome to reach out to me. Um, have a wonderful uh, day and weekend, and uh, hope to be in touch with you all soon. Take care. <laughs>